There's always been a special kind of anxiety associated with back to school season. Are you with me, Hurley Burleyites? As a boy growing up in Saskatchewan, it was always this time of year when that nagging voice in my head told me, you are never going to understand how the Krebs cycle works and your future as a scientist is over. And of course, that was true. This year during COVID, there are extra concerns parents and kids are facing. Our presenting sponsor, TELUS, is helping with that. They're giving free school supplies and backpacks to more than 13,000 vulnerable Canadian kids to help support their safe and successful return to learning. The annual TELUS Kits for Kids program is led by their community ambassadors who provide free backpacks filled with all the essential tools school kids need, lined paper, exercise books, a pencil case, colored pencils, pens, erasers, and more, plus a TELUSWISE insert with tips and resources for how to be safe online. And this year, the kit contains reusable, dual-layered, cloth critter face masks to help stop the spread of COVID-19. The masks are also available for purchase on the TELUS website, with all critter mask proceeds going to the TELUS Friendly Future Foundation to support COVID-19 relief efforts. That's an addition this year due to the pandemic, but the program has been up and running since 2006, with more than 163,000 kits for kids delivered to local schools to support students in need. And it's just one of the ways TELUS gives back to communities all across the country. To learn more, visit telus.com backslash community. All right, good day, intrepid Hurley Burleyites. Before I get to today's pod, I want to give a big Hurley Burley virtual hug to Polly Lego, who did such a fantastic job of capturing Scott, Jenny, and I in a Twitter post on Sunday, calling us the best fucking political podcast around. We were all incredibly touched by it, and we thank you from the bottom of our enormous rum and coke filled glasses. Never in my life did I think I would be Lego worthy, Smurf worthy maybe, but not Lego worthy. It's a two-parter on the pod today. First up is author and professor Alex Marland. Alex is professor of political science at Memorial University in Newfoundland. He's a co-editor of the UBC press book series, Communication Strategy and Politics. And he's long been investigating and writing about what goes on behind the scenes in our political sphere. We're gonna talk about his new book, Whipped, Party Discipline in Canada which examines the hidden ways parties exert control over elected members of Canadian legislatures. Why is it that our politicians behave mostly like trained SEALs who vote on command and repeat robotic talking points? For part two, we'll bring on our political panel strategists extraordinaire Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed. They'll share some stories about how they whipped and were whipped. Plus, we'll dive into our remembrances of the amazing man and public servant John Turner. We'll make our fearless predictions for tomorrow's speech from the throne. We've got an election coming up in BC. We'll talk about that and what lessons they can take from New Brunswick and lots more. But right now we are here with Alex Marland and I'm so happy to have you on the Hurley Burley. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, where do we find you this morning? I'm in St. John's in my office at Memorial University. Oh, so you're going into the office. You have no cases out there. Uh, there's very few that I know of, but certainly it's pretty quiet around the university. It's, it's all locked up. So I was able to get in just for this occasion. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're not normally working there. How are things? How have you been handling the pandemic? Uh, by working. Actually, the, the preparation for remote teaching, it, I, it really is a lot of work. It's, it's surprising. You've had to revamp your approach to teaching. Yeah, because all, all the materials that you put online, you know, you know, students are going to be inspecting them and examining them, you know, in class, you can kind of fudge it, you know, when you're, when you're putting things on YouTube, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> There's an accountability there. Oh, completely. It's the same thing in politics, of course. So the book, Whipped, lest people get the wrong impression, this is about parliamentary democracy. Um, but nonetheless, this slightly risque term seems to be used quite a bit when talking about these kinds of, uh, these kinds of issues. Uh, tell, us about, tell us broadly about what your thesis is in this book and what you've, what you've told us. Well, I set out to try to understand why is it that Canada is characterized by so much message discipline? Because in 
Canadian political science, there's a lot of discussion about party discipline. And that's usually about people in, you know, legislators, both in Ottawa and in the provinces, all voting the same way, voting with the party. But when I did some research about Stephen Harper and the, the conservative government, I, you know, I was really interested in how message discipline permeated through them. Justin Trudeau becomes prime minister of Canada. And at first there's this sense of things are going to be relaxed, but then things tightened up in terms of messaging and control and coordination. And so I started investigating, well, how is it that, that MPs in particular, particularly backbenchers on the government side, how is it that they end up saying the same thing everywhere? And so my, my overall argument and thesis is that party discipline has left the legislature. It, it probably did a while ago, but certainly I'm, I'm trying to document something that, a phenomenon that has been increasing with social media. If you think about it with social media, there's an opportunity for politicians to have their own voice, to raise concerns, and for the most part, instead, what we're seeing is social media becomes a place to, to parrot, to simply repeat things. And so why is it that we're in a society where there should be even more flexibility, and instead, it seems like there's more monitoring and more of a clampdown? Okay. And what's the answer to that question? <laughs> well, it turns out, uh, so what I ended up doing, I ended up interviewing an awful lot of people. It was more than 130 politicians and political staff across the country. And I had not fully appreciated the pressures that politicians are under to say the same things. Um, you know, it's, it's really easy for those of us who are not in the political game to somehow say, well, you know, they, they should have their own voice. They should be able to stand up and, and vote as they like. And, and really, when you're in politics, you start to realize very quickly, and, and I'm not in politics, but this is what people have told me, very quickly that if you go off message, there's all sorts of media drama. Your opponents exploit that there's caucus division. This is then turned into a proxy for weak leadership and undermining the leader's uh, position. What I hadn't fully appreciated was internally what goes on, that there's all sorts of pressure from peers. So if you take a stand as an MP and you are against what other members of the caucus are, are doing as a, on a united front. You might be a hero in your riding or elsewhere, even nationally. But what's happening is you're creating all sorts of pressure on your colleagues. Because now what's happening is their constituents are saying, why aren't you more like MPX right. who's taken a stand? And so then there's all this social shunning that occurs as well. Um, you now, because you're making the rest of the group look bad, you're going against the team mentality now maybe your calls aren't going to get returned quite as quickly. Maybe you're not going to get invited to go to social events. When there's lunch going on, someone's not going to sit with you. Um, that, you know, I was impressed by the number of people who told me they care far more about what their colleagues think than they ever do what the whip could say to them. So you're describing a situation here, and it's kind of implicit that it's a problem. But is it a problem? What's wrong with what's the, with the current situation? So that's a great question because so many politicians would say to you that they want messaging. You know, they, there's just too many issues going on for them to have a, a good assessment of, you know, what to say on a given item. So they, they actually are requesting messages and they get uncomfortable if they don't have it. But ultimately, the, the problem, I would argue, is mostly for backbenchers on the government side of the house because they are in this murky area. They are being told to go out and repeat the government's message. And yet the system is designed for them to try to hold the government accountable. Them holding the government accountable means taking a stand. It can be private, it can be public, but all of the institutional factors mean that if you take a stand, you might not get promoted. Um, so that's got problems for your career aspirations, but also your ability to maybe get things done. Um, certainly, if you cause any embarrassment, you can be uh, shunned by your colleagues, as I've mentioned, and, and cause all sorts of trouble. And so ultimately, most politicians realize it's better to toe the line. And I think I would add that the problem with our system is that 
for those who do take a stand privately, those who are really good internally at, you know, working together as a group to affect change, publicly, it's really hard to take credit for that. Because ultimately, you can't say, well, you know, I was, I was working really hard because nobody sees it. And so in the end, we still get the impression of this idea. There's a reason why this term uh, that really came out uh, during the, the George Drew and, and Diefenbaker years about trained seals, there's a reason why it still continues today. So what has happened to caucus meetings? My understanding when I first got involved in politics and members of parliament in Mr. Trudeau's government would tell me stories. Of course, I mean, I, I, I'm interested to look to you for historical perspective. But at that time, we thought that Mr. Trudeau ran the government with an iron fist. Um, that he and his office of Jim Coots and Tom Axworthy, they were hard-nosed operators who really kept a tight ship and there was no dissent allowed from, uh, from Mr. Trudeau in the Liberal Party. And uh, yet caucus members told me that caucus was a very free-flowing thing where MPs felt totally free to stand up and make a strong argument and there were real genuine debates in caucus about the future direction of policy. So they felt, even though they looked publicly neutered, that they had a private avenue of influence. Is that still the case? It's a great question. So what I've read about um, Pierre Trudeau's caucus meetings, uh, Brian Mulroney's, some people were telling me about his caucus meetings, uh, Stephen Harper's, is that there was a, an incredible amount of reverence for them as prime ministers that uh, you know, these are people who either had charm, certainly in Mulroney's case, or, you know, wit or just their intellect. Um, and so people would often walk away from those caucus meetings, potentially with a different opinion, just because they were so impressed by how the prime minister was able to explain the situation. I would, you know, the, the research that I've done, the people I've interviewed tells me that things have fundamentally changed in caucus meetings. And the number one thing that I can determine that is different is the presence of political staff, and in particular, staff from the leader's office and, um, you know, from the prime minister's office, from the premier's office, and et cetera, who have a fixture now in caucus meetings. That did not used to be the case. Things have evolved because now the media is so fast-paced is there's not enough time now for staff to simply get a, a summary after the fact about what went on in caucus. They need to find out what's happening in real time and they need to follow up with people if there are problems and issues that are arising. That's the justification. There is so many staff now, it, you know, it used to be from, from what I understand with um, Paul Martin and with Stephen Harper, you know, you might have the chief of staff, maybe somebody come in, make a presentation and leave. It, it wasn't a, a regular thing. Um, but with Justin Trudeau, there is a, a, a group of staff members who are attending caucus meetings, at least certainly that has been the practice. And why that's a problem and why that's a challenge, even though there, I understand why it happens, is if you are a member of caucus, your willingness to speak up in caucus is going to diminish if staff are present because whether it's true or not the perception is that staff have some control over your life and your career and what it is that you want so i i'm of the belief that we would have stronger democracy even though it's it's not visible it's not seen stronger democracy would happen is if there was an in-camera session for every caucus meeting where staff are asked to leave so there is some private time with the leader that if without that, you start getting into some of these problems. Some of the issues with the SNC-Lavalin um, controversy, I would argue, emerged as a result of some challenges that occurred within the Liberal caucus because there wasn't enough in interaction directly with the Prime Minister. Things could have been a lot worse, but they could have been a lot better. The staff issue, in, in, in addition to the um, reluctance to speak up, you know, I think there's, a, I think there's an important status distinction. Um, when Mr. Martin was the prime minister and I was the campaign chair, uh, on any given day, at any given time, I was as or more influential than any individual member of parliament, backbench member of parliament. 
except for once a week, they went into this meeting, and I couldn't go. And that was their place. That was exclusively for them. And that was their opportunity to speak privately with the prime minister. And that, I mean, you know, that most times the elected officials are, sub, are subordinate to the staff members. But that was that caucus was the differentiating factor, that that was a privilege that they had as members of parliament that was not open to staff. I thought it was an important distinction at the time. Yeah, and, uh, you know, there's there's some indication that the the problem I think that staff find is that when you allow um, backbenchers to have direct interaction with the leader and you don't have staff acting as gatekeepers, what happens is the leader is prone to make all sorts of commitments or you know say that things will happen without consulting with staff, and that can cause problems for staff to have to manage. And so, you know, th this dynamic has been going on for a long time. It was going on during Pierre Trudeau's time. Uh, you know, it, the creation of regional desks in the prime minister's office was a source of controversy at the time, because the idea that you would have these regional desks, you know, kind of running interference with the prime minister caused so much consternation that there was pushback. Now, regional desks exist in the prime minister's office as a permanent fixture, as staff who are dedicated to receiving uh, inquiries that are coming from MPs in certain regions and their staff. More than that, regional desks are now a fixture in ministers' offices, so that it's not even possible to get access to a minister the way that it was years ago. Um, so there, there's definitely been a transformation. The ability for the legislative branch to get access to the executive branch uh, involves going through staff. And I understand the reasons for it, and it's not necessarily bad, but it does have implications for the way parliamentary democracy operates. What do governments these days generally think their MPs are good for? <laughs> well, when you say governments, I assume you mean cabinet. Do you? Is yeah. That, yeah. 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 Um, so the the view that I have is that you know when you when you look in the in the literature from years ago, there was a, a period of time where MPs and others thought of themselves as as legislators, as people who made laws. Um, when surveys were done, this is what MPs would identify as. Gradually, that got replaced a little bit with MPs looking at themselves as constituency caseworkers, as helping out constituents, providing service. And that's still very strong today. I make the argument that now increasingly a, another layer is added on to that role, which is that of brand ambassador. The idea that you are promoting messages. You are, uh, as an MP, as a backbencher, again, this applies at provincial legislatures, although it varies, part of your role is to help spread the government's message. So you are given messaging and you are expected to help go sell it. Now, that's not, that's not new. Um, Brian Mulroney talks about in, in his memoirs about, you know, encouraging the caucus to spread the government's message. That's, as I said, that's not new. What's different is now MPs have an even greater ability to do it because of social media. They are able to communicate information on a daily basis. Um, when jo or Pierre Trudeau was prime minister, uh, there was a point in the early 80s where MPs were given a, a, a record, an LP, with information on it. And they were given a, a plastic kit and they were sent home for the summer and said, God, that you sounds can. like Dennis Mills. If you're listening, Dennis, surely that was your idea. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. but now it's different, right? Now they have messaging every day instead of a record player. Uh, same old song, though. Well, <laughs> it's, it's it's just faster. Um. So, I mean, but that the role has to have ad adapted to something because surely they can't be legislators. Surely we can't expect them to be legislators. I mean, the, I don't know, not historians, so I don't know the extent that they ever were, but when I look at how an MP is resourced, what their basic level of uh, subject matter expertise is going to be on any given area, uh, what kind of briefings um, and information that are available to them, um, the intricacies of making policy in a federation and a stakeholder-driven uh, society and the speed at which things operate, 
uh, I don't see any role for Parliament in creating the governing program. Right. And I mean, it, it's, it's the government that's, that's their job anyway. I mean, it's the cabinet's role to, to do that. Um, but what has changed is you're absolutely putting your finger on it is government has simply become larger, particularly after world war II. And so, you know, the, the amount of expertise that exists in the system now, you know, departments, government departments don't operate in silos. They are constantly consulting and engaging with each other. Um, so the, the idea that I think part of the challenge for a lot of legislators um, is they think that they're getting elected and they're going to go in and be involved in policy development. But really the, the, the genesis of, part of, of policy development is occurring at the grassroots level through party conventions. It is happening much earlier on. It's happening in the election campaign platform, the throne speech. I mean, it's, it's not by the time it gets to the MP to have a look at, you know, there's too much has gone on for them to suddenly suggest, well, I don't think we should do this. Discipline is um, also a factor in accountability, though. Could I not argue with you that this much stricter sense of discipline that exists now um, is helpful to voters and gives them a clear line of accountability and what they can expect. So somewhere between 95 and 100% of people vote on the basis of leader and party, not local candidate, uh, in any given riding. There may be some area, some rural ridings, and there may be some individual candidates uh, that are exceptions to that. But most are not, despite the fact that most will think that they are. Most are not exceptions to that. And so let's take, for instance, Mr. Trudeau, the Prime Minister, this current Prime Minister Trudeau's edict about choice and about how you cannot run for the Liberal Party unless you um, are going to adopt a pro-choice public position. Um, when Paul Martin was the leader of the Liberal Party, we were a pro-choice party, but we had explicitly uh, anti-choice people in the caucus who were vocal, who could be counted on to vote against a woman's right to choose if, uh, if it came up. And that certainly muddied the waters for a voter about what they could expect from the Liberal Party on that specific issue. Whereas Mr. Trudeau's edict, which obviously to some extent removes all decision-making and flexibility on an issue that's traditionally been considered an issue of conscience, on the other hand, leaves Canadians crystal clear as to where the Liberal Party is and what they can expect from the Liberal Party on that issue. Is that not of some value? So uh, you're right, and I challenge you on another side of that. <laughs> so uh, there's no question that there's value in clarity, that if you are running as a candidate with a party and there's a platform and the leader is saying things, it's good for Canadians to be able to say, I, I understand what I'm voting for, especially the way the, the media attention where it's all squarely on the, the leader. Um, it's also clear, to, good to have all these things articulated, um, ministerial mandate letters and other things so that everybody can see, okay, this is what is going on. Of course, where this becomes a problem is twofold. Number one, it begs the question of, you know, what is the point of MPs spending all this time in the House of Commons and, and other legislatures just voting the way they're told to vote. Uh, you know, it's, it's really mind numbing for an awful lot of them that they have so much to contribute. And this is, you know, why not just mail, literally mail it in? Like just, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And the other thing is what happens when things arise that were not articulated in the election campaign or the election campaign platform? So inevitably there are times quite often, in fact, that the prime minister or the premier will advance an agenda that was not discussed in the election. Well, then, you know, where, where are we having that conversation? It, you know, how can you say that this is a fair representation of accountability? So that's where legislators come in, that there should be this, this debate or else it should be parked till the next election, which obviously sometimes that's, that's not viable. Did you come across anything about John Turner in your um, in your studies for this book um, as committed a parliamentarian and as committed to the rights of backbench MPs as anybody you'll find in Canadian politics? 
um, passed away obviously this past weekend. Did you uh, did you come across anything? Well, I'm um, glad about him. I'm glad that you raise it because, in fact, I have a, an anecdote uh, related to this book. Um, so when you're conducting research and you're trying to interview people about message discipline and party discipline, you can imagine that immediately you hit a wall. You know, all sorts of people don't want to talk. They clam up. Um, and usually as a researcher, what happens is, you know, I was very lucky to have uh, good participation. But nevertheless, there were quite a number of people who uh, clearly didn't want to talk to me. Uh, who, you know, said they were busy or just ignored my, my repeated requests. And, you know, that happens. John Turner is mentioned in the book because he was different in the following way. He declined my interview request. But unlike others, he phoned me to tell me. So we ended up having a really nice conversation. We ended up talking about Jack Pickersgill, who uh, was a, a significant minister um, for a period of time with Mackenzie King and, uh, and St. Laurent and, and for Newfoundland and Labrador. And in opposition, help bring down the Diefenbaker government was a lead spear carrier for the liberal charge against Diefenbaker in the late 50s. Yeah, I think Diefenbaker, there's a quote, of, he says something like, uh, Parliament would be like, uh, without Pickers go, it would be like hell without the devil. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, my point is that, you know, Mr. Turner was gracious on the telephone. He was very nice. He said he can't do the interview, too much time had passed. And, and I was so impressed that I wrote that in the book that he had done that. Um, so when you hear remarks about him being a gentleman, uh, you know, my, my one experience with him is that that is an accurate reflection. Yeah, that's for sure. What made me think of him was, uh, to the extent that parliament is considered important now, it's about question period. And so that's the accountability mechanism of Parliament. It's important, obviously. But what Mr. Turner often bemoaned was that the House would be full for a question period and empty for debate. And it was the debating aspect of Parliament that he thought was so critically important, presumably as a place where, uh, as opposed to accountability, as a place where consensus might be forged or people might learn from each other, and there might be a sort of a common, a, a commonality uh, discovered uh, over the course of debate. Or, but at least there was a forum in his mind where the country could see the great issues of the day debated and played out. I don't think anybody sees Parliament that way right now. Is there any chance it could be that? Well, before I, I answer the question about what what question period could potentially be, or what Parliament could be. Um, with respect to Mr. Turner, when he was leader of the opposition, I read that he wanted to devolve who gets to decide what questions get asked during question period uh, within the liberal opposition. And so we set up a, a number of committees. So usually this is controlled by the leaders. The leader's office is trying to figure out, you know, who's, who's on the lineup. And what ended up happening was even though he was devolving so much so that he was empowering his caucus, people ended up doing end runs and going to the leader anyway. And so it just tells you that uh, how, much, how much authority ends up being concentrated in a leader, even when you have somebody who is trying to devolve that authority. Uh, with respect to question period and, and uh, parliament overall, I, I think that it, it's almost impossible to, to solve that predicament because as long as you know, you're going to have excellent questions with excellent answers, and if it doesn't result in media coverage, then the motivation for a lot of politicians is going to diminish. And as long as the fascination with what happens in question period is about, you know, one-liners and zingers and interesting delivery and drama and anger and other forms of emotion, you know, that plays well on television and video in particular. Um, so these, these short quips end up being, being what carries the day. I, I don't think the question period can really be a, a wonderful place for deliberation. We have to put our faith in parliamentary committees for that, and even those have some challenges. I don't. I don't know. Um, I don't know that what I'm going to say is right. It's based on purity and impression, and it may have something to do with the phenomenon you're documenting, or not. But it feels to me like in decades gone by, old man talking here. In decades gone by, you could see policy developing. 
you could see a debate taking place within a government. There might be some ministers on one side, some ministers on the other side. You, from the outside, you could kind of see things develop and take shape, whereas now I find that process much more opaque and things just emerge, um, fully baked um, out of things. Um, is that a phenomenon that you've observed in this, and does it have anything to do with the role of the MP in the process? Well, I think, you know, for a lot of people in government, they might take issue with, with what you're suggesting naturally, but I think because the level of, of consultation, the amount of information that's available online is very different than it might have been at a, at a given time. Okay. I mean, so if, if, you know, we're thinking about pre-internet, it, it would be, you know, where would you go to find information? You might have had to go to your MP. Uh, whereas now you can, you know, hold up a device in your hand and potentially find the information almost instantly. Back then there were um, these things called newspapers and they were interesting. Right. And there were, uh, there were probably more newsletters uh, that were being sent out, particularly if you were a, a party member, you might get more inside information than, than necessarily now where you're being asked to donate money, it seems, on a daily basis. Um, I, I think one anecdote uh, or one interesting element that, some people may be interested in is I came across a interesting video produced by CBC in the early 1970s called the noblest of callings, the vilest of trades. And I was able to get this through uh, library and archives Canada. And it was fascinating to watch because there's long interviews with all uh, a variety of MPs. Uh, this was during the, the time that Justin or sorry, Pierre Trudeau was prime minister and mostly they're, they're liberal MPs, but not exclusively. And it's, it's actually on Parliament Hill, and, and they're, they're having these long conversations. And some of the things that struck me about that is how some of them were saying how they felt completely useless. They felt, you know, one of the, one of the remarks that sticks with me is one of the MPs, uh, somebody from York, said, you know, the role of the legislator has basically gone. The bureaucracy is just too large now. And so they were making these comments in the early 1970s in a sense of frustration. Sure. What struck me is just how much of that people could say today. In fact, uh, there was a, a line that uh, was used in that video from the 1970s. And uh, I noticed that MP Scott Reed, uh, the other Scott Reed, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he ended up using the same line about how an MP is basically a Victorian child sit in the corner and be quiet. There's a 50 years a span between the two of them using this expression. So should one conclude then that it's always been this way and it hasn't changed much or has there been a direct line trajectory of centralization and control? Well, uh, there's another book out this year. Uh, this one is, is very heavy into political science um, called Lost on Division by a, a professor at the University of Montreal, uh, J.F. Godbout. And whereas my book is about interviewing people, his book is uh, quantitative. It is looking at, he, he has examined the numbers of how people voted historically in parliament. And he was able to show, you know, relatively conclusively that there was a distinct change that occurred um, both in the early 1900s and in the 1940s. And his argument is that ultimately the main driver of this change, you know, there's lots of factors, but the main driver, he argues, is the standing orders changing in the House of Commons, that over time, the rules that govern debate has diminished the opportunity for the average MP to stymie what the government's agenda is and what it's trying to do. And so the government has a lot more control over the agenda in the legislative branch that in turn complicates the ability of the legislative branch to hold the government to account. Okay. Interesting. Now, I've always thought that Prime Minister Trudeau, this one, Justin Trudeau, became the Prime Minister, became the leader of the Liberal Party, and became the Prime Minister in a very unique way. He became the leader of the Liberal Party without needing um, the support of dozens and dozens and dozens of caucus members. So unlike every leader who came before him, 
whose organization that got them to the leadership of the party was built in large measure on caucus and elected members. This was not, um, because there were very few members when he became leader. Most ridings didn't have an, an MP. And then the election was so clearly carried by him, and he so clearly won that election for the Liberal Party, and all these newbie MPs came in, and all they really knew for sure is they were there because of Justin Trudeau. So he didn't know anybody in the cabinet anything, and he didn't know anybody in the caucus anything. And that is, in my understanding, a wholly unique situation in Canadian politics. And how do you think it has affected his government's relationship with backbenchers? So I love that you're asking this question because Justin Trudeau is unique. Um, the, you know, the, the ability for him to become leader of, of one of Canada's, if not the main political party in, in Canadian political history and to do it with, you know, to be fair, a relatively thin resume compared to a number of individuals who have become leader before him. It, it, there's no question that he's unique. I would say that there are a couple of things that I've detected from interviewing people about how uh, he runs the, the government and how he is as leader that's slightly different. Number one, he does not interact with backbenchers the way that his predecessors have done. Um, so I write in the book quite a bit about uh, Brian Mulroney especially. He's, you know, he's in a class of his own in this, but about how Brian Mulroney would reach out to people. You know, even, if, uh, even if there was somebody, if, if you're in a backbencher, and your child is graduating from high school, you get a letter from the prime minister saying, you know, the, the child gets the letter from the prime minister saying congratulations for graduating from high school. I mean, it was incredible the amount of outreach that Brian Maroney engaged in, but others did as well. And one key thing was a lot of them would have people over to 24 Sussex to have something to eat, or they would mill around and they would uh, have conversations around Parliament Hill. Um, Justin Trudeau only really started doing that, as far as I can tell, uh, after the SNC-Lavalin controversy really hit. Um, up until that point, there wasn't a big need to spend time kind of schmoozing with, with MPs. And so a number of them were, were quite frustrated about that. But the second thing that's quite different is the amount of power that uh, Mr. Trudeau has invested in his senior staff. And in particular with Katie Telford and uh, previously with uh, Gerald Butts. Now, I know that that's come out in the media, but it's also come out in when I was interviewing people that it was, it was quite amazing how challenging it could be to get time with the prime minister. Whereas from what I've been able to determine, previous prime ministers, you know, you always have gatekeepers. I mean, you, you have to. But at the same time, it was a lot easier to get access previously. And you know, the, the Trudeau PMO made some adjustments after the snc uh controversy, but the amount of outreach is much lower with uh, backbenchers on the government side of the House than it has been with previous prime ministers. This will make Jenny Byrne happy. I just have to say it or she'll consider me unfair. She regularly tells us that despite us liberals thinking that Harper was a dictator and a despot in power, that he has ran a looser message control, lesser, looser control over his backbench, uh, less centralized government than we are current, than the liberals are currently running. Is that true or not true? I don't know that I could say definitively, um, but I can say that um, the perceptions are exaggerated on both ends, that the way Harper was nowhere near as authoritarian as he is often portrayed. And uh, Justin Trudeau is nowhere near as accessible as he's often portrayed. Uh, for me, this comes through a lot in, uh, in editorial cartoons. If you go back and look at editorial cartoons of Stephen Harper, he's often portrayed as Darth Vader. Um, you know, there's very few cartoons of that nature with Justin Trudeau. What's the provincial level like? Is it better or worse than the federal level in terms excellent of the power of backbenchers? Yeah, excellent question. Um, the answer depends to some extent on who happens to be leader. Um, 
you know, obviously with uh, Doug Ford initially with his uh, chief of staff, things were, were quite a muck compared to maybe the way they are now. Um, in the, the main constant that I was able to determine is, uh, and, and this won't be a big surprise, but in smaller provinces where there are fewer resources, um, things are, are much more ad hoc than they are in larger provinces where there's more formalized systems. So in a place like here where I am in Newfoundland and Labrador, you know, the, the idea of parliamentary committees, I mean, they barely even exist. Um, there's just not this formal structure. And so, you know, you can literally, if you're a, a member of the, the provincial assembly here, you can just call the minister and just say, hey, what's going on? I mean, you, you run into each other down at Costco. I mean, it's, it's just not the same. Uh, whereas in a larger place, uh, you, there's going to be more layers of staff to have to get through. So, Alex, my last question for you is this. Somebody who is a talented and able person who you think has a contribution to make to Canada, as part of their community, comes to you and says, I've been asked to run for parliament by X political party. Do you think I should do it? What do you tell that person? Uh, I think the first thing I would suggest is I'd say read some of the materials that are produced by the Samara Center for Democracy. Um, because the Samara Center, the Toronto-based think tank, um, does a lot of research about challenges associated with Parliament and the opinions of, uh, of MPs. And, and a lot of it will open your eyes. I, th I think the main thing that I would say to somebody who is aspiring to be a candidate or, or to uh, have a seat in a legislature is I would say, you know, you need to realize that you are not in control you are joining an established political club and it's not up to you to rewrite the rules without working with others about how that club operates. So one of the challenges I think for a lot of candidates is they don't fully understand that it's not up to them to decide and, and behave as a free agent. You give up some of your agency when you join a political party and you have to follow those rules. Um, the key is how can you be a really st strong team player within the boundaries of those rules? How can you figure out when you can push those rules just a little bit? Um, so that would be my comment is do, do a little bit of research before you jump into this job and don't have rose colored glasses and, and be realistic about it. Alex, thank you so much. This has been a, a great, a great conversation and your, your book whipped is a tremendous contribution to our understanding of uh, the role of parliament and how it works. Um, it's great to get to know you. Take care of yourself. Stay safe. All right. Thank you for having yeah. me on. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. So you probably haven't noticed it, but it's a fact. Trains keep getting longer. It's not uncommon nowadays for CN's locomotives to pull two miles of cars behind them. And that, as they say, is a good thing. Because a single train hauling cargo inland from a Canadian port removes up to 300 long-haul trucks from our highways. That means not just less congestion on roads, but less greenhouse gas and other emissions. Trains are just better for the environment. Eventually, though, a train has to be unloaded. The so-called intermodal containers eventually have to be transferred to trucks, which is how almost all cargo travels the last few miles to stores and other businesses. That unloading takes place at CN's inland terminals, like the one it plans to build in Milton, near Toronto. The Milton project is important. It will allow CN to keep smoothly delivering essential consumer products in Greater Toronto and Hamilton. But the company is proceeding with great care, working with conservation groups and government agencies to minimize impact on the environment. In fact, the Milton terminal is expected to be the railroad's most environmentally advanced facility in North America. And as we mentioned here a couple of weeks ago, CN has ordered a fleet of zero emission electric trucks. Terminals like the one in Milton are where those quiet giants will be put to work. Everyone knows the railroads helped build this country. That work continues. Okay, Jenny, Scott, we're back with the political panel. Fresh from our Lego fame. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Finally, I can get my kids interested in politics. <laughs> and their old man. <laughs> that, was, that was awesome. So thank you again, Polly Lego. That was... Uh... Uh, we've made it. We're Lego characters. It's, it's I was like, so useless with Lego as a kid. There's no chance I could have put that together. 
I still have to do All that, I can though. do is jam one box on top of another. I could never make anything. I've got little kids and Lego these days is like an unbelievable. You have to have a, 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 a civil engineering degree to get through it. It's <laughs> astonishing. But And I love, David, that you had the Rough Riders jersey on. That was amazing. I, that, was a, that was a really nice touch. And, the you know, the rums were life-size for those little... Uh, they were life size. I, I don't drink. I don't drink rum. I, I can't drink rum, but uh, I I would happily hold the glass for a. Uh, yeah, you're uh, with us in spirit. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you in spirit. But but he got my new hair, which was good. My Yvonne DiCarlo hair. And he Yvonne DiCarlo, and and he nailed it. He like he nailed your hair. It was perfect. I, my hair might have been a little orange. I thought I looked a little <laughs> bit like Ronald McDonald, kind of you know. But I'll you take look, it. You, you, you looked creepy. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, like, yeah. I gotta leave the seminary soon <laughs> now speaking of the the undead hair of jenny you've come to grips with this over the course of the last week jenny you're like this was a source of conflict between the two of you last week well i googled yvonne de carlo and she was pretty hot so i, I i'll take it yeah. no shit this is what i was trying to tell you yeah. right? it's crazy hot it was a big compliment and, you know, you acted like you'd never been compared to the undead. To a zombie I mean, get before, over yourself. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, looks like we're all in Toronto today. Jenny, you're at home in Toronto? I am, yes. Is Fenland Falls over for you now? Or are you in Toronto full time? Uh, I've been in Toronto. Um, my uh, my business got, uh, got uh, we took possession of our office uh, about a month ago. So we've been slowly moving in there. And so... Um, I'm hoping in the next week or two that uh, the next time you guys see me, I'll actually have like office decor in the uh, in the background. But right now, it's just plain white walls, so that's why I'm I'm at home this morning. Awesome. Fenlin, is, Fenlin is never dead, though. Fenlin, Fenlin. is never dead to yeah. me, though. No, and uh, do you go back in the fall this time of year? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. I'll go back. I was going to go back a couple weekends ago, but uh, uh, that fell through. But I'll, yeah, I'll be I'll be back uh, here and there during the during the fall. I am scurrying back to the lake on sat on Saturday while I can still get out of here. 425 cases yesterday. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm worried that if I wait too long, I'm going to get trapped in this bloody city again. It's like world war X. Like uh, you think, uh... well, I got to get back to where all my canned goods and long arms are. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Quebec could shut the border again. But that's right. Literally, that's one of the things I'm genuinely worried about, that I, if I wait long enough, I won't be able to get there. Well, Ontario's cases they're going to announce are at 478 today. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. but, only three, but only three hospitalizations. So uh, uh, a friend of mine and David's said on a conference call I was on last week, when the beginning of the week, when I think we were up at like 180 cases or something like that, he said... Within five or six days, we'll be regularly back in the 400s. And I don't know how he knew that, but he knew that. And he just said, look, it's the exponential math of how this works. And it's, uh, you know, and, and the name of the game will be trying to contain it around five and then work it back with measures. And we're going to be over like, a thousand oh. within a week. Okay, but could it be that we're doing more testing? Ontario's like ramped up all the, the testing. Yeah, but the positive test rates are still higher. It is yeah. true that we're doing more testing. But the positive test rates are still higher. The R number is but well over one now. But the hospitalizations are are less. But many people say, and if you look at what's happening in you know Spain, France, it's a lag indicator. So let's hope it isn't. Let's hope when we defy because it's younger people. Because yeah, it's um, like something like sixty percent of the community spread is among people under the age of forty. But we also don't know where it is, right? Like they say that less than fifty percent of people are responding to contact tracing. So. You know, Joker's wild, right? And um, th that I assume that in the speech from the throne, I want to jump ahead. We'll come back to it later. My app has not yet told me that I've encountered anybody. Come close same, to any uh, same. I've never had it go off. Mm. Um, uh, I have it because I'm not downloading the app. I check it for. I check it once in a while. You're not. Sure wait, 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 wait. You're not downloading the app because of why? Uh, because uh, you don't want to be tracked by Big Pharma. Uh, by government, by Big Pharma, I'm okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna fall into the 95 percent of Canadians that haven't downloaded the app. So you guys are two of the five. All right, who's up for you guys? Okay, right. well, when you get it, uh, you'll have to tell me because the app won't be able to tell me. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so, big event in, of the week in Canadian politics was the death of the Right Honorable John Napier. Turner. 
somebody Scott and I knew uh, very well. Um, somebody that I worked with extremely closely. Um, I went through the highs of the, the lows of the 84 election, the highs of the 86 leadership review, the highs and lows of the 88 election campaign. I've rarely been as proud in politics as when he did that virage on in the 88 debate, took on Turner on free, took on Mulroney on free trade, um, leapt out of my chair. And it was as much for him personally that I was so thrilled to see that happen as for anything. Um, and, you know, uh, relevant to a topic that's much discussed today, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, obituaries talked about how he was a Bay Street guy and a business liberal. Um, but his 1988 platform had universal child care in it um, and, the, and the money to fund it. Uh, so uh, on an issue like that, he was well ahead of his, uh, well ahead of his time. Um, Scott, is there anything you want to say about Mr. Turner? Well, you know, I'm like, I, I'm like you. I had an enormous amount of admiration for him. And uh, I didn't know him as closely as you. I joined, I, I came to Parliament Hill in 1989. April of 1989 was my first job on the Hill. He was still the leader, but he, he stepped down and made way for the leadership um, in May of uh, 1989. Um, you know, my, uh, my favorite recollection of Mr. Turner um, and you, you'll remember the night well, David, um, you know, have to indulge me, but I, you know, we can talk about what a great parliamentarian he was. We can talk about the fact that history forgets how, what a magnificent contribution he made to public life, parliamentary life, to government, uh, prior to the 1980s. But yeah, he was a man in full right? Olympic athlete, Rhodes Scholar. This guy made Sean Connery look like the least handsome guy in the room. He was something else. And my- D Dated a princess. Yes. And my favorite recollection is Mr. Turner's birthdays became an institution. So it would become a political event. Uh, his 90th birthday held last year had literally, I think, hundreds of people at it. It is a lifelong regret of mine that I missed it. But for years- uh, going back 25 years ago in the um, in the 90s, it was a much more intimate affair. And David and I were lucky enough to attend a number of them. And I remember one night, I don't know, David, if you recall the exact year. I'm going to say it was maybe 94, possibly 95. Yep. And we had um, Mr. Turner. I think 95 because I think it was the okay. 75th. Okay. So we had... Really? Holy smokes. Okay, well, then this story is going to be even more impressive, I think, uh, because uh, 75, cheapers, creepers. Um, so we um, we have dinner for him over at, you know the restaurant probably, Les Fougères over on the... No, Chelsea. sorry, that would have been 65. If 1995, 65. you would have been 65. Right? So 65. So still. Um, so yeah. he's your age now. So uh, you know, <laughs> still impressive. And... So we have dinner for him at Les Fougères. And this is only, this is before it became a production. So it's like 25 people and it's former staff of his. And it's, you know, I think maybe Craig Oliver, the great Craig Oliver might've been there. A couple of reporters from, uh, from the city. And it was a big boozy affair. And Mr. Turner would hold court. And over the course of the evening, he would tell these stories. And, 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 and they're astonishing. I mean, they're, they're, the, the life he lived is a life that no one else lived. This guy cut through the 20th century. Uh, he's a, he's Grace a McCarthy's ears would have been burning those uh, nights. Oh, God. <laughs> Unbelievable. Like he told, so Errol Flynn, Errol Flynn, Robin Hood, Hollywood's Robin Hood. Right? Errol Flynn dies on a yacht under, shall we say, dubious circumstances, <laughs> right? Off the coast of British Columbia in international waters. The Hollywood folks are freaking out. Is this a scandal? What's going on? He's hit the legal repossession of the body is a bit of a murky question. You got officials in the US, officials from Canada. You've got the, and so who do they call? They call a young lawyer from Canada, John Turner, to get onto the boat and take possession of the body. And let's just say RFK Maryland's room there, okay? And so he would tell that story. He would talk, speaking of RFK, they were very close friends. He would tell that story. So the whole night carries forth. 
He was, was a he was he was a pallbearer at Bobby Kennedy's funeral. It was unbelievably close to him. I can remember. I think it was at that that dinner. He was talking about RFK and tears welling up in his eyes. I mean, he was remarkably close. Uh, the Princess Margaret stories and talking about how Catholicism came in between him and the royal family, like just so. You're listening to all this all night long, and it gets to the end of the evening. And we're all extraordinarily flush with scotch. <laughs> and um, we don't want the night to end. So it's like, okay, well, where are we off to next? Well, we're in the deep woods of uh, Quebec. There's no goddamn place to go. Peter Connolly, who's former chief of staff, and some people from politics will remember Peter, um, he says, well, I've got a, I got a cottage here in Meech Lake. Let's just go over. The only, only one, one slight catch it's only accessible by water so me and hurley and mahani and a bunch of other <laughs> guys and we're wearing suits and we're stinking shit face drunk and we're getting into like these 12 foot aluminum boats with like outboard motors and you know and we've got the former prime minister of canada with us bombing in the night waters and it's a <laughs> We could have all been headstones. It was a wildly irresponsible thing to do. We get over to Peter's. He's got this beautiful cottage, spills out onto the lake, big floating dock. And obviously he had been thinking this might be a possibility. The place is just packed with coolers and fridges and there's large bottles of quantities of scotch. And so we sit up and for a number of more hours and the stories continue. But night is followed by day. And... We're all in suits and we're laying on Peter's cottage floor and propped up in deck chairs and the sun comes up and I'm, I know I wake up and I'm only like 25 at the time. I'm supposed to be young and full of stamina. I wake up and the sun is shining down on me. I'm kind of cold in my suit. I'm all fucked up and hung over and I smell and it's like tobacco and booze and vomit and stale beer and I'm Oh my God. And I'm just, I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I now have to get up. I have to get in a boat, get to the shore, find a car, drive home, shower, shave, put on a suit and go to work. And I'm like, and right now I can't lift my arms. Right? Like I'm so fucking hung over. Well, as I'm thinking that Mr. Turner goes walking past me. And he's looking a little worse for wear, I'll be honest, right? His suit jacket's still on, but it's a little disheveled. His hair is a little out of place, which never occurred. And he walks past me, and the sun is starting to come out. And he walks right past me and a group of the rest of us. Walks down to the end of the dock. Right? Leans down onto his knees. Sticks his head in the lake water like a great old bear. Shakes his head around. He did not say Guna Gugu. No. Lifts his head up, stands up straight, shakes his jacket, knots his tie, strokes his hair like this, and then he turns and he looks down the dock at all of us, and he's perfect. The sun has captured him in silhouette. His hair is pristine. It's the look of a professional hangover man who has done this millions of times and knows exactly. He's Julius fucking Caesar. He's beautiful, unblemished by the night. We're all dying 30, 40 years younger. But just the best part of it is as this is happening, and the sun's greeting him like his chin is a welcome home for its uh, rays. He's just so freaking magnificent. This woman is paddling by going on an early morning canoe ride. She's dipping along and she looks over and she sees this horish looking group of individuals all covered in empty bottles and sin and the former prime minister standing there and she says, well, looks like you fellas had quite the party last night. Mr. Turner, who had lit a cigar by this point, puffs it out of his mouth, exhausts a giant plume of smoke and says, lady. You got that fucking right. That, <laughs> that is John Turner. And uh, he was just, it was just magnificent. So I'm sorry that story went on a long time, but God, I no, remember that memory. God, I loved him. He was such a mentor to me in so many ways, but I, I remember one story when he had the young liberal executive to, uh, and now he had us to 24 Sussex just before 
he left office and he had us to Stornoway. So I can't remember where this was, but I think maybe Stornoway. But in any event, he had the young liberal executive there. And I was 22 years old and um, sitting at this grand table and I'm in a social environment that I've never been in before. I think by this point I've grown out of my polyester suits, but I'm probably in corduroy. And, um, <laughs> and the first course comes and um, I look at my plate and it is some type of ground meat with some type of crust on it and then a piece of gelatin under the crust and next to the meat. And I'm staring at this because I've never seen anything like it before and I'm not sure what it is. And from the end of the table, I hear Turner's boomy voice. He says, Dave, that's pate. Guys from Saskatchewan don't eat that shit, do they, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely perfect. Um, those are fantastic. Any, those are fantastic stories. I have obviously no stories about uh, uh, the prime minister. I met him. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet him a couple times in uh, uh, when I worked for uh, Prime Minister Harper. But those are fantastic, fantastic stories. He was. He was. A, he was a person, and I. Um, I've been missing him for a while, to be honest, and I miss him now. But it was a. Big moment on uh, on Saturday. It feels at a certain point like chunks of your life disappear when that happens. Um, so uh, there's an election in British Columbia. Um, as anticipated, he actually went through with it, pulled the plug. Now we're into it. Now the opposition parties are playing the there shouldn't be an election game. This is all political opportunism. The media are chiming in. This is all to be anticipated. And the question is, how long does this phase of the campaign go on? Um, and if it goes on for a long time, it's bad for Horgan. If it goes on for a couple of days, it's inconsequential. Um, but he has to he has to have a clear reason for having called it in order to move past this. He's going to have to make the election about something uh, in order to get past this, there's no reason for the election. I don't think he did a very good job of that yesterday at all. I don't think he articulated a clear reason for why they're going to the polls. You were okay. just distracted by the garbage cans behind him. <laughs> it was a lovely visual. Yeah. That I'm was. As, I'm not as damning on the garbage cans. I'll come back. That to is. That. that is. That is a. That would be deemed as a tour fail. And and uh, um, I don't know about you guys. I loved when tour failed on things because tour wreaked havoc in everyone's life because every everything had to stop for like normally for like small events that nobody like paid attention to. So when tour used to fail, it used to make me. Uh, it, it privately used to make me. Uh, somewhat happy on uh, on that stuff <laughs> i don't think it's i don't think it's going to matter there's a lot of similarities between new brunswick and bc take away the fact that bc is obviously uh a much bigger province there's now more of an uptick in uh obviously in uh in covid cases um but i i'm not sure it's going to uh i'm not sure how much more than a few days um uh, that this is going to be a process story. I could, I could be wrong, David. I think you're right. I think he, he didn't make a clear enough uh, case as to why uh, there should, uh, should be an election. I think there is a clear case. We've talked about it on the podcast that, um, uh, you know, governments and minority positions can say, listen, uh, over half of parliament, uh, over half of alert, our legislatures don't support uh, the obvious general direction the government is going in. So uh, we need a mandate, uh, a mandate by the people. But he's a he's a premier who lost the popular vote in 2017. I think he got just over 40% uh, uh, of the vote. And if you look at any of the uh, any of the polls um, over the last uh, the last couple of months, he's got between 48 and 50%. So he's he's a minority um, uh, a minority premier that only needs a few seats to actually get into maj majority territory. Three, right? Yeah, and he's Great. he's he's seemingly there now. Uh, you know, I, I want to pick up on something you said, David. I was struck by, um, I was struck by the way he addressed uh, the public in calling it. Um, forget the garbage cans. And by the way, I it for sure is a two or fail. The only <laughs> thing I would say is it it did look it looked 
pretty real lived in that place. You know, you kind of had a bit of a shed and you had some stuff kicking around. You had a couple garbage cans. The only thing I would say in his defense, it, it looked pretty real people there, but um, you definitely okay. aren't supposed to have garbage. At least they uh, didn't have them in the empty in fields with a Quonset 100 yards in the background like they were doing with Tim Hudak in 2014. Oh, don't even get me started on Tim Hudak 2014. <laughs> I could talk for an hour. But Scott, you just have to admit, you, you would smile a bit when your tour people fuck things up. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 because they're smarter, better, and get the hell out of my way more than I am. So, um, And, you know, the tour people might occasionally have had a thought about Scott. I Well, <laughs> well I know the tour was people. sort of confectionery to buy me, the funniest story of Scott. They all love me. So, But I was struck, um, forget the goddamn garbage cans, I was struck by... Um, by the fact that he had obviously invested enormous, as you would, enormous energy and preparation into trying to frame his reason for calling the election. Uh, his remarks were long. Like, I watched them last night on YouTube. I watched them again. Like, he spoke for 20, 25 minutes, which was too long in my view because, you know, there's, you know, it becomes obvious at some point that if it takes you so long to say something, uh, you must not have it crisply defined. And, but I also think he looked nervous. Like I let, I, I, and I, I think he's the best politician of the bunch um, by a mile. I think he's heads and shoulders a more capable politician. He will be a more capable campaigner than the others, but uh, the other leaders. But I, I thought he looked nervous. I thought he looked uncertain. And I think he can't spend the first week of the campaign apologizing for calling the election or, or acting like he's embarrassed about the fact that he has to answer this question. And I don't think he should do it. I don't think he should take a mulligan. If I was working for him, I'd say, um, you spent a lot of time preparing for that. You tried to do it yesterday. You didn't do it very well. Now is the time to do something else. They're going to keep asking about it. And, you know, you run a real risk if your reason for calling an election is that you'd like to be thanked about the job you've done to now, as opposed to talking to people about the job that you want to do and the priorities that you need to accomplish. And I would, I would turn the page fast, let the others talk about there shouldn't be an election and just say, here are the things I want decisions on. Here are the policies I'm for. I don't know if these guys are, but I don't want to dick around because I think they're what we need in this situ situation. And just stop talking about... Um, well, we have to put the politics behind us and the future ahead and forget all the fun in lines, forget all the bullshit, just start putting like real things in front of people and campaign on that. I think he will. And my, my sense is that, you know, this may stagger along for two, three days, but he's, he's going to win. And maybe Wait, well, two or three days, two or three days is fine. Um, <clears throat> for this, it doesn't matter all that much, but he needs to put something on the table that will distract people, that it, creates some it's kind gotta of debate. Be, yeah, I agree. It's got to be more than just about uh, the pandemic. It has to be um, it has to be about jobs. BC is actually in a very good fiscal position compared to uh, other provinces because of LNG. Uh, it, conceivably, in the next few years, uh, we could see that uh, BC surpasses Alberta as the former, for lack of a better term, uh, goose that laid the golden egg in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, their fiscal capacity. Because both uh, during uh, that's good, we need somebody. Well, uh, well, uh, yeah, I guess some provinces do. Um, I, it, it, it won't stoke uh, the Western alienation any any more than it uh, than it than it already is. But because forestry uh, has uh, uh, forestry has not suffered during the pandemic, and and uh, LNG the pipeline um, uh, has has continued to be built. So, uh, in a, in terms of a fiscal uh, uh, fiscal position. Horgan has actually done a uh, a very good job as as premier, and if uh, to Scott's point uh, about turning the channel, that's where I, I'm going to be talking more about that and less about the uh, uh, the pandemic. The the actual pandemic and cases and what have you are going to be something they're going to have to deal with during the campaign, but it should not be the focal point of their messaging. And the liberals have to to use an example you've used on this show in the past, Jenny. The liberals have to Churchill um, Horgan in that they have to make the election about the future and jobs and the economy, not about the handling of the pandemic in the past. So we, we've all been talking about how that debate's coming and how the, the in, in the future, in the next six months, politics is going to be about jobs and the economy. And um, they have to advance that. They've got to pull that into this election campaign. Um, and... Uh, and if there's a sense that Horgan's just resting on his laurels and doesn't have a plan for the future, it is possible things could change. It's possible. But has Wilkinson done that? Uh, most people would have to Google who the liberal leader 
uh, was. I, I don't think his response, there was very little coverage of any response that he had uh, had yesterday to uh, Horgan's presser. I, I looked it up and it was an unimpressive effort, I got to say. Um, and I don't know him really. I know his brother a little bit, who you probably knew, uh, Jenny, from your time in Mr. Harper's uh, uh, government. But, uh, you know, there, I, I would just say two things on that. One, it feels to me like the Liberal Party, which out there for people from Central Canada may not know, it's the Enterprise Party. It's a coalition party of conservatives and liberals. And, and it feels to me like it shrunk. Uh, in this last three and a half years, and that it has not, it has not maintained. It has become uh, uh, too much the party of um, uh, of a narrow business interest, and uh, and I'm not like a left wing liberal really, but I just think it it does not feel to me like it has ceded ground to Horgan and the NDP in terms of the middle of the spectrum and and the middle class voter, and and they've got a. The, uh, the Liberals have to fix that. I will have to see if Wilkinson can do it. I'm not sure it's in his toolbox. The other thing, to your point, David, yes, they they need to be the party of saying, okay, here's the thanks. He did a great job so far. That's fine. But now here's the he may not be the right person for the future. I don't think that's built exclusively around jobs in the economy. I think that's a big component of it. But I think what we're seeing now is that the political sands are shifting. And you, you've got to be demonstrating as much sensitivity to people's anxieties about a uh, second wave and about, a, uh, uh, you know, it's public health first, economic recovery second, and you can't get that balance wrong. You can't get that sequence wrong or you'll pay a political price. And I think that may be a trap that they fall into. I think they may start doing news conferences about, you know, capital cost allowance or something and people go, hang on a goddamn minute. Um, you're missing a beat. Doesn't Bonnie Henry give the Horgan government a cloak of invulnerability on pandemic handling? She may. I think she may. Um, uh, I, I think she is very credible. Her, her and uh, uh, Dr. Hinshaw from Alberta, I think, have, have been the most nimble, have been the most truthful and compelling of the, uh, you know, public health officials that we've had to uh, listen to over the last uh, uh, over the last six months. So I think that from the pandemic point of view, I think that she ob she, she is an asset for the uh, BC government. But I think that. Part of Horgan's calculation is exactly what we've talked about before, is right now the economic consequences of what has happened uh, to the world, COVID, over the last six months have not been felt because the government has subsidized people's uh, uh, people's lives. And so that uh, that that cannot continue. It's just not sustainable. And I know we're going to get into it. Uh, in terms of talking about the speech from the throne, but it's just not possible. And so I think this is a calculation that Horgan has has made that it's not going to get better for us because, you know, it's the Churchill, like David, you brought it up and we've talked about it before. People's personal economic interests will trump everything else if that is the, is the ballot question, if that is the choice. And right now, um, most Canadians, I'm not saying all, there is, there's massive unemployment, so I'm not saying everyone, but for the most part, uh, Canadians have not felt the consequences um, as to... Not as much as they will, that's for sure. Yeah. It, uh, I don't know the Green leader very well. And obviously the departure of Weaver is a big shift. And Horgan was using that as a shield, right? He's been saying, look, one of the fundamental changes in the composition of our legislature is Weaver's departure. That's who I really signed the deal with. That gives me some moral license to walk out of the deal. But is she good? Has she got game? Does anyone know? I don't know. I don't know either, but I also don't know, even if she was good, what space there is for the Green Party in this election. This feels like a real difficult line for them to walk. The polling I've been doing has indicated that while climate change has not gone away as a public issue, uh, its priority has been significantly lessened in this period, well behind both handling the pandemic and handling the economy and creating jobs and, and growth. Um, so I, I, I really, I mean, the election feels like it's framed in a way that there's no space for the Green Party to, to fit into it. Couldn't she wedge in by saying, look, you know, climate change is an issue of public health and there's a commonality to these issues and you can trust us more on those issues. And is it the, isn't Vancouver Island so rich in, in, in green sentiment now? Like, can't you, can't you find... Like, I, I just think they've they got a foundation out there. I mean, that's a pretty granola place. 
It is, and there's some things going for them. I mean, last week, Vancouver had the worst air quality in the world yeah. uh, because of the California wildfires. Uh, so there's got to be some resonance and salience about those kinds of issues in British Columbia. I don't mean to write them off. I just mean that it feels like a, a it feels like an election on a set of issues at a particular point in time that is really poorly suited for the Green Party to do well. Well, and don't the Greens always poll higher than what they actually then end up get? Well, like they don't have much of a they don't have much of a GOTV operation ever. Well, uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, like my days in the reform party, it, it's, uh, uh, they're not going to win on the ground, but um, it's just, it's, it, it seems to be like, you know, the spotlight was on, uh, on Betty May. We were talking at the start of uh, when we were doing this a year ago at the start of the podcast that she could win upwards of 10 seats. Um, and, uh, and, you know, uh, went, uh, went nowhere. There has, they, they, as a movement have to, and this, this could be a pod for another day, but they, as a movement have to have more than just climate change, if they're actually going to be seen as mainstream and, and win seats, which is what they tried to do. If you looked at, and we talked about it a bit last week, um, uh, in terms of their messaging in New Brunswick. So they actually have to, it can't just be about climate change. If the green party want to make, uh, want to make gains, but there's no coherence to that party, uh, beyond no. that issue. It used to be actually full of a lot of kind of small C conservative type mm -hmm. people. And so on non-environmental issues, it used to lean to the right. Now it's been flooded with a lot of left-wing progressive types. I don't really know what they think about fiscal policy. No idea. Um, and I don't know that they have any idea about that. Um, maybe they're sorting that out in their federal leadership right now. Um, so let's say, let's say we're advising Horgan. Say we're advising Horgan. Jenny smiles as if that's unlikely. Um, <laughs> well, he could do a lot worse. I don't know if you've heard, but we've got Lego characters, so we're kind of we're kind of the shit. <laughs> Let's say in week two of the campaign, cases spike to another level. And it is the kind of spike that would cause you to be shutting society back down what do you do how do you incorporate that into an election campaign that you called oh go ahead scott well i was going to say I, I go back to something you said a minute ago right? um you 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 have to um begin uh, with dr bonnie Right, like you, 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 you've got to. You, you, if if she is the foundation stone of uh, where you're at in terms of the perceived perce uh, perceived handling of this, um, then she's got to be front and center. She's got to be um, standing a slightly distinct from the government during the writ period, and you've got to follow that lead and be seen to be following that lead. So you're able to say, independent of what it means for me electorally, I'm going to be making certain that we make the appropriate public health moves. So I think you know. You you got to start from that premise because if you skirt that, if you're answering questions about how come you're doing this, even though, you know the 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 best advice from a public health perspective appears to be to do that, um, then then he'll tear apart his own the logic of his success, and you can't right. afford to try with that. Yeah, I don't. I don't disagree with that. I think that BC um, has had a very good uh, opening up. Uh, 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 opened up plan. They, they have they have uh, uh, been one of the provinces that has been uh, the most successful in terms of opening up. The, the cases have gone up, but cases were always going to go up, and that's kind of I think what you know when you hear Bonnie Henry and and Dr. Hinshaw speak is uh, as schools opened and as. Uh, society open, there was always going to be uh, a spike in the cases. And it's been uh, jurisdictions that have started to learn how we're going to live with this because it's possible there is no vaccine. And and, and I don't want to get into a whole, you know, we've debated this so much, but, um, and there's a possibility, there's reports that there won't be one at least for the next two to three years. So if that's the case, uh, societies have to learn how we live with uh uh, we live with uh, we live with this virus, and I think that British Columbia has done a very good job of doing that in terms of the response. Um, uh, if if you were going to rate the premier, so to speak. Yeah, I agree for sure. So two weeks ago, we talked about how uh, expectations were running absolutely wild about the speech from the throne, and that they were going to spend so much money it was hard to tell where what direction it was going to go, and there was certainly no way to tell where it was going to come 
from. And then last week we talked about how they'd been madly reeling in expectations about the speech from the throne on many of those fronts and how it looked like there'd been some fundamental come to Jesus moment inside the government where they had said, holy Christ, actually, we got to keep our eye on the goddamn pandemic and we can't be uh, sounding like we're uh, utterly uh, uh, in a different universe on financing uh, things and fiscal policy. Uh, so now this week, uh, assuming the governor general has time to read it in her schedule, there will be a speech from the throne. <laughs> I look forward to her insistent paragraph that she herself has written. <laughs> Spread your space arms with me and let's embrace our cosmic <laughs> destiny. <laughs> but as she, as she like whips a pencil That's at some right. poor staffer uh, uh, in the... Uh, uh, off to the sidelines. That's right. She's like, you always capitalize Andromeda and she <laughs> hits somebody with a ruler. <laughs> okay, Jenny, on the person, as the person on this panel most plugged into this liberal government, what's going to be in the speech? <laughs> well, that's, 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 that's not true. But, uh, um, that uh, is so. <laughs> um, but no, to your point, you know, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, it was going to be like, you know, as you know, Scott's joke before a car for you and a car for you. Like it, this was going to be like you know the Wizard of Oz, like the yellow brick road of uh, of spending. And this this last week, they they put out that Freeland is uh, chatting with uh, your ex boss about fiscal prudence and what you guys had to go through in like 1995 and 1996. So it's been a very he makes odd... a hell of a shield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure they obviously are walking back. Um, uh, they are walking back uh, certain uh, certain expectations because, uh, but I think it's still going to serve as more of a vision document. It's becoming clearer and clearer. Um, I, you know, Scott, you are completely right about this that they don't want an election. Um, I think it's stunning because I would be looking at it the same way Horgan is being looked at, like as as Horgan's looking at it. I'm in minority government and I need few seats, and the opposition is somewhat in turmoil. So I want to go, but it's seemingly like they don't want an election. We'll see. Things can change. That's the the thing in politics; they can change um, on a dime. Uh, so I still think the speech from the throne that we see uh, we see tomorrow is going to be. Uh, uh, a lot more uh, visionary uh, in terms of uh, there might be one or two nuggets. Maybe they talk about a guaranteed um, uh, income, uh, but it's going to be more uh, visionary, which I think it always was going to be um, because it's kind of bought them some time because they're not exactly sure what they actually want to do uh, next because of probably the fiscal capacity um, of, of the government. I think they're going to have challenges. For example, uh, they've really ramped up talking about uh, the green economy. And to your point, David, climate change is a bit different, is, is, is different in people's mindset now uh, as they navigate through the next steps of COVID. So it's going to be in very interesting to see what they say on that because of how it will, uh, how it could impact or the messages that it sends to like Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC, for example. Well, I don't know what in fuck they're going to do. And, and, I, and I think that that's uh, an oddly important piece of insight. And here's why. Because um, we go back to what you were saying, David. You know, two, three weeks ago, uh, this thing was being presented as uh, a potentially historic document. It would form a forward legacy for uh, Justin Trudeau as he would remake uh, at least the social fabric of the country. That They would have a historic reinvention of uh, public policy, both in terms of... You are not overstating this for effect. I'm not. This is what I'm not, they I'm were not saying. even joking. This is kind no. of the way it was being presented, right? Yeah. We would, we I would thought it was a, actually pretty exciting. Yeah, we would have a green revolution. We will uh, uh, reinvent the way in which public policy responds to public health. And we will uh, transform our economy and position it so that we have a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis our, our, our allies around the world. And, and this has been – and then that got pulled back. Uh, and now, um, my like, if we, we make it a three-week beat, so that was the first week. Then last week, it was uh, pulled it back. Um, and uh, the third week, this past week, I would say is crickets. It's silence. And the reason I say we don't know what the fuck is in it is because there hasn't been a leak. But more importantly, there hasn't been any preconditioning. Like, so, you know, it, it felt to me like they, they lurched back scared of the implications of what they were originally signaling and said, mm, that feels like it's an overreach, so we got to alter that. They clearly made a decision that they do not want uh, to use it as a provocation for an election. So if that was ever in their minds, that got dumped. But what they've not done is they've not, they've not reestablished 
with any kind of preconditioning and, and, and message construct, what we will get uh, tomorrow. And, and this is not atypical of them. They don't really do it. Their budgets were almost non-events in terms of uh, uh, delivering a message or explaining a storyline. And so, um, you know, I, I find it puzzling. Like, I don't know why they didn't dedicate the But this faces another test. Week. You guys, this faces another test, doesn't it? Which is, doesn't it have to be rigorous enough to justify prorogation? I mean, yes. this was the justification for prorogation, was that they needed the time to focus and work on this document. Yeah, yeah I think that's gone. I that's, think this is the incredibly shrinking SFT. But what does it, what's it, what, what is the uh, downside going to be for them if that's the case? We'll, we'll talk about it. Scott and I will talk about it on TV, on CTV. You'll talk about it on CBC. Um, and, uh, you know, the opposition will talk about it. But what are the actual consequences? If they don't want to go and it's a bullshit speech from the throne, uh, it doesn't matter. And because these things are all an Ottawa bubble thing, um, uh, speech from the thrones, especially. And, and for the most part, um, most part, budgets to a lesser extent because they actually have far overarching consequences uh generally in terms of uh uh in terms of policy but i don't think it i don't think it matters people only talk about the speech from the throne if something bad is in it generally could, think of a speech from the throne in our political careers that you remember because wow it was like the prose the, it was so fucking amazing it's oh, yeah. always this it, it it doesn't happen it's like for me the one speech from the throne that i can think of is the one where we floated out that we were going to change the national anthem um uh to make it gender uh gender neutral and like poof and like i <laughs> uh, it, it all went to fuck so. strangest mistake you guys ever made right like of all the mistakes i would expect you guys it's an it's a kind of an off-brand mistake Just it was me. it was it was i was at the party so i'm not and i ne wouldn't have paid really attention to the speech on the throne even when i was at the prime minister's office i was at the party and uh um, uh, at the time and, uh, and it was a period where, uh, my mom was very sick. So I was, you know, she was at a palliative care Institute. So I was, I was there a couple times a day. Um, and I was sitting at my desk and one of my friends messaged me and said, and I had this, I had the TV on, but on mute. And, uh, uh, my friend messaged me and said, we're changing the lyrics to, to the national anthem to make it gender neutral. And I said, no, we're not. That's fucking ridiculous. And so I get on, I get on my bl big Blackberry. I think it was one of those torches, which was my favorite Blackberry. Oh, I love that. I love the torches. Is that the sliding one? The, the Matrix type phone. It went up. Oh, okay. The, and um, I, I got on our BVM chats because it was BVM's back, BVM oh, yeah. back then. You stayed and, one step ahead of the law that way. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was messaging people in the PMO. And then finally someone responded and said, no, we talked about that, but we took it out. And then they responded back going, FFS, it's in there. Fuck, it's in, <laughs> it's in there. And I remember... Oops. I remember like driving, driving my car like that night in the drive home show on like the pop radio uh, station where the DJ, like the non-political DJ is just ripping us about, uh, about this. And, um, uh, uh, and then the next day, basically we got a ton of calls into like HQ and what have you. So of course the lines the next day were when we never said we were changing the national anthem, we just said we were going to consult about changing the national anthem and, we have now consulted, and we are not going to proceed ahead with it. Well, well, that was a good call. I had I had a lot of um, just on the subject of, of of the generic creature that is a speech from the throne. I, I hate them. I've always hated them. We had an opportunity, or what was your I, role in writing them? I thought Nicholson wrote them. Well, Nicholson would write notions of them and then we would have to be involved me and Feshek would end up scribing the things like I can remember I, I remember but what I what, I mean when you were awake you mean you and Feshek yeah well which was rare with, um, with, like with a pail of beer <laughs> with a pail of beer well that's how they all ended up being produced ultimately because um you know but I remember Feshek and I had this idea and once and one of the throne speeches that we went and we said you know what here's what people would like from a throne speech we want it to be very clear very precise and very, most important of all, very, very fucking short. Let's make it a six-minute throne speech. Let's just talk for a couple of minutes and then boom. And that failed 
almost instantly. People <laughs> were sort of attracted to the notion, right? In the same way, they're like, do you want to go to a sideshow uh, and like, you know, see the bearded lady? Yeah, that sounds fun. But like, no, 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 no. We're not taking that person home. And so the short SFT fell apart. And it's because, and this is something that tells you about government, <laughs> right? And what it tells you about government is, right, like people don't know who haven't worked in government, the perverse and revolting effect that a speech from the throne has on the senior public service in the government. And the reason well, that they that take it seriously. I was going to say, you may Everybody, think it should you gotta be- Everybody's got a sentence you, in there, right? You may think it should be four minutes long for public communication purposes, but the bureaucracy pays attention to the speech from the throne. And if something's in there, that mobilizes action in the bureaucracy. For good or ill. Uh, so the machinery of government is opposed Ooh, to the idea I, of a succinct. A, a very, <laughs> I have never seen bureaucrats mobilized to action to be quick on anything. Oh, but anyway. to, to protect to, to protect their ability to argue that they've achieved turf. Boy, oh boy, let me tell you. So you know, ev- ev- there's a competition to get a, uh, your sentence inserted, right? Is there a reference to your department? Is there a reference to your initiative? Oh, we're going to build a hydrogen factory in the sky over the Arctic Circle. <laughs> Yay, that's my department, right? Like, that's what happens. And so the idea of a succinct, sharp, short SFT gets crushed, right, by the banality and that sort of Wolverine-esque competition that happens between state deputy ministers. Everyone's got to get their sentence in there, and everybody wants to get their sentence in there, and people end up just sort of dying uh, and going all right fine just give him his sentence give her give her a paragraph whatever and then the thing just sprawls and becomes pablum and that's what we're going to get tomorrow we're going to get a regular sft we're just going to get a regular sft okay i'll make you a bet i bet you that there's something of note in there and my something of note that i think is going to be in there is that while i do not think it will uh, commit to a basic income or a guaranteed annual income I think it will talk that language, and I think it will promise to pull together all of the income support systems in the country into a more streamlined and seamless and more generous underpinning of support, especially for gig workers and for people that would normally uh, not qualify under under unemployment insurance. So I think there will be language and direction about moving toward something like a guaranteed annual income. And they'll create a process that will make room for the NDP to contribute to its composition, which will give the NDP the capacity to claim that they've secured a victory. I agree with all of that. And it may well turn out to be enormously consequential. Um, But we're not going to see a sharp, precise, bold uh, program launched in the SFT. Um, Instead of this is what's going to this is what's going to tell you who we are. That'll be kicked to the budget now. Yeah, but I think it will also commit to a major economic statement this fall of some kind. I agree with should. that. I hope it does. Right. Well, it's been a year and a half since since the last budget. March of 2019 was the last budget. Do you think they should bring in a budget or an economic statement, Jenny? Do you think they actually have the capacity for a full budget this fall? I'm sure they have the capacity for it. Uh, whether they're going to do it or not is is one thing. Well, I guess the argument is, do we really, can we really um, make those kind of firm decisions and projections yet, or are we still too early in the COVID economy to know really where we're at? Well, I think they've got to start. There, there, there could be a budget this fall and a spring economic uh, update, uh, so to speak. Uh, but we are a country that has now gone a year and a half uh, uh, without a budget. And if, uh, if, if the bureaucrats and departments have not been working on uh, uh, on things except for like firefighting every day and, and uh, you know, daily pressers, then, then they haven't been doing their job. That's what departments should have. There should have been a whole team of people who have been doing nothing but figuring out uh, what are the next steps. Regardless, there could be different, there could be different parameters, there could be different factors, but they should have at least been planning out uh, what, what Canada's economy is looking at, looking like um, uh, for the last six months. I'm, I'm less wound up about the fiscal framework going forward and the identification of projections and so forth, because I do think all that's written smoke and, and will probably be changed by the time it's published. Um, but you can't give an accounting of the decisions and the costing of the decisions you've made to date and what the implications are going forward. And you can give an accounting of, uh, of ideas that you want to pursue, and you can start to put um, flesh on those. So I hope there's a 
uh, an economic statement that uh, is effectively a budget in the fall. I, I hope it's something that's of, of um, real substance. There are big decisions to be made. You talk about the income support stuff. That's huge. We talk about child care. But beyond that, you know, there's decisions to be made about whether we're going to continue to have programs that are of general application and agnostic in terms of sector or whether we're going to make the uncomfortable but maybe just necessary decision of saying there are certain sectors that are that are, that are uniquely distressed and we've got to do something about them or that we're going to watch them slip beneath the waves and uh that's a tough decision like i mean you know people who are advocates for one or the other pound the table make it sound like it's obvious what to do but it's a really difficult decision because if you do say we got to do something for transport sectors we got to do something for airlines which i think it makes sense especially when you look at the support they're getting from governments around the world elsewhere well, then you do find yourself in a world where every sector is going to line up. Well, and on say, what basis do you not think support airlines and not restaurants? Precisely. So then you are going to have to. Those are the two that jump to mind, right? The, the, the restaurant sector, airline sector, maybe the more broad retail sector. Um, so do you do that on the basis of sector or do you do that on the basis of um, – uh, some other set of criteria, employment levels, uh, advanced manufacturing, and whether you're uh, oriented around that, um, those kinds of things. Those, those are tough and somewhat, maybe some people find them boring, but they're really uh, vitally important decisions that have got to be made, if not in the throne speech, then in a budget. Well, and it's not just federal governments that have to be giving some thought to this. Uh, it's also provincial governments. I, I actually have been, uh, uh, you know, sympathetic to the federal government in terms of, uh, you know, the municipalities and the province. Uh, they basically show up uh, with their hands hands out, looking for unlimited amounts of uh, amounts of money. And it's the feds that have pumped in a lot of money uh, during COVID uh, in terms of the. Um, uh, the employment subsidization or the economic subsidization of, of, uh, of families. And I think that um, they have to make some tough decisions, which is why we talked about uh, the fact that they have walked back, they kind of, you know, blow the barn doors off uh, of spending from three weeks ago to where they are now. And I think that it's no different from uh, the federal government to provincial and municipalities. They have to make, they're going to have to make tough decisions in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of spending decisions, and and to your point, Scott, um, what they're going to help to have to do to uh, help different sectors uh, or not uh, in their provinces slash municipalities. And central to all of that, very quickly, you get into the absolute political wood chipper of the energy, oil, and gas sector, and. If you're going to start to move into sector specific initiatives, what do you do for the oil and gas sector? How much are you propping up um, what was versus trying to uh, create and, and midwife what will be? Um, and those are enormously dangerous uh, decisions from a political perspective because you can't tell people, um, sorry, your industry, we've had an examination and your part, you're busy dying. And so we're just going to walk over your grave and get to the next thing. You can't do that. Um, and th I think that's why we've seen them recede somewhat with uh, the talk of um, our economic recovery will be uh, splashed in green. I think they realize it'll take them into decisions that are both economically and politically uh, full of jeopardy. You know what I'm worried about? The end of mortgage deferrals. I'm not. I'm. I'm not as worried about that. I think if you take a look at the, if you take a look at the stats, I've spent a fair bit of time actually looking and working in this sector and in this area. I think if you take a look at it, the mortgage deferral, uh, like let's take BC. Uh, I just saw some data yesterday. It said seven percent of BCers with a mortgage took the deferrals, but the analysis that the overwhelming majority of them, and I mean like you know ninety five percent of them, did so not necessarily because they were unable to pay their mortgage, but they did so as a matter of um, uh, husbanding all their resources at that point. They were anxious about where the next buck was going to come from. And most of them have found themselves, their savings have gone up, their financial situation has been okay. Um, so I'm, I'm not worried that we're going to sort of end up splashing. But what about all those households that downturn. lost an income earner? I mean, people take the max mortgage these days in the big urban cities, you have to. You've got all the mortgage you can possibly carry and then you lose an income. I just think the scale of the challenge is... is, is uh, less overwhelming than people uh, oh, okay. think. I, I don't. I, I. I. I mean, the deferrals come to the deferrals come to an end for the most, the vast majority of people at the end of this month, right? That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. 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 I mean, because one of the things that really differentiated the American 
experience in 2007, 2008, 2009 from the Canadian experience was personal home foreclosures. And the people that in America were sure. losing their homes hand over fist and, and Canadians didn't. And that is, that is a big uh, difference in the experience and why it was so much more scarring down there. And I, I really would be... I'm not being dismissive. I'm happy not an to issue. see that start to happen here. But people have talked about it as a cliff. I don't think it's a cliff. I think it's I, I think it's a, a a challenge that will have to be managed. But it's going to be a, a I think a much more precise subset of the uh, uh, of the country. What does worry me is that structural employment decisions are going to be taken over the course of the next three to four months, where a lot of organizations have been sort of in emergency drill mode, and now they're going to say now we're having to take real. A real blue pencil to our, uh, our our operations, and we're going to decide that that business never coming back. So we're shrinking our workforce by 30, 40, 50 percent, and so we'll find that now where it feels like employment's rising because people are coming back to those jobs, we're going to find that there's a second wave, so to speak, economically, jobs wise, where people will be let go, and that that scares me for January and February. It, I think it's I, I agreed, and I think we've talked about this on the podcast for for. Uh, uh, the podcast before uh, months ago is is that the next round of uh, the next round of um, uh, what I worry about in terms of restructuring or layoffs are are not going to be people that could potentially get by with a two thousand dollars serve payment. Um, uh, there are people that are kind of the true middle class, making anywhere between you know one hundred and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and have mortgages uh, that they whether they deferred or not, uh, they've been working from home, they've had mortgages, and those are the people like I you know I'm on I'm on Bay Street right now. I live on Bay Street. And so like, it's the people in the big office towers in banks and large corporations where, uh, uh, where these organizations, these companies, corporations are going to restructure and it's going to be, um, it's going to be a map, like it's, it's going to be the people with the, the mortgage in Oakville's and Markham's yeah. and Burlington's who have traditionally commuted downtown that are going to be restructured. And I think it's going to be a huge, huge hit to the, uh, uh, huge hit to the economy. Middle income professionals are a lot harder uh, to to paper over uh, with supp income support because uh, their incomes are a lot larger. Exactly, um, and it's uh, I, I I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I hope this doesn't happen, but I'm anxious it will. Uh, I agree. Well, there's a Kielberger joke in there somewhere, but I'll leave it. Uh, so. <laughs> On that note, when you're done listening to us, go pick up your copy of Elusive Destiny, The Political Vocation of John Napier Turner and his great friend Rick Alway told me how important the word vocation is in that title when it comes to, uh, to John Turner, uh, more than a job. And uh, lots of great anecdotes in here, but lots of great history about the role that he played. And when you're done reading the book, pour yourself a healthy drink of scotch and you'll feel like a new man. New man. New man. Feel like a new man. All right. On that, thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jenny. This was thank fun you. again, as always. Thank you, Metal Donkers. Good for engineering this. Thank you, Jill Engelman, for producing it, and the whole Air Quotes media team. And if you like what you heard, give us a shout out on social media or a rating and review on iTunes or make something of us with toys. There's other things. <laughs> yes. Lego, yes. Right? Uh, so, in any event, however you'd like to honor Jenny Byrne and Scott Reed, you feel free. Uh, you feel free to do that, and I will see Pick you. Pick up we sticks, will... perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all see you next week. Bye, Hurley Burleyites. Bye. 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 Bye.